Good morning. I'm Mary Rayburn with King County, and I'm here to talk about stormwater and environmental justice. Okay, talking about environmental justice and stormwater is really like talking about a uh, hundred years of history that we're trying to change. They are very similar in that way. What we're going to take a look at in that in 20 minutes is a tiny slice of that hundred years of history. So we're going to look at what is environmental justice, a very speedy definition, how you can do these projects or start integrating these, and then why. Why should this be business as usual? What is environmental justice? I have taken the liberties of distilling the EPA definition down to, thank you, Mr. A.V., down to this. Environmental justice really is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, all of your audiences, in environmental outcomes. But I would probably add to that that really it's recognizing the role and impact of historical wrongs and things that we have done. You know you're changing your stormwater systems. There are certain things we need to change in our human systems. And then also that to do this environmental justice, we're going to try and meet people where they are in a form they can use and at a time they need it and that's relevant to them. So part of environmental justice is what is equality versus equity. So equality, and I'll use some classic cartoons that we use here. Equality is, hey, you gave everybody the same thing, one size fits all. Equity is your attempt to make the sizes fit. We have small, medium, large. But really to do this work well, we really look at what were the original processes or systems that got us into this problem in the first place? Really try to address those parts of the equity picture. Thank you. Another way to look at this is, and I'm borrowing this from Equity Matters, is the continuum. And you have to ask yourself, where are you and where are your projects on the continuum? So in general, we tend to have meetings that are way down at the exclusion end. We have special groups that we invite in to comment and help us build our policies and processes. We may move to the one way where we decide to have a public meeting. We'll invite people to come to our time and our place to do this type of information exchange. And then we may even be in the superficial area where we're kind of, you know, we realize there are people not like us, so we'll send a table out to their cultural event, but we won't have an interpreter or the language that they can access. Or we may actually move into compliance, which I, I get a lot of comments on this. It's like, we need to translate stuff. Okay, translation is just a tiny step towards, but it's a good step towards recognizing that really to get to the equitable end of the spectrum, your translation really should be with your community. It has to be relevant. Our concepts, everyone in this room we have our special language and our special work that we do, and it doesn't necessarily translate to our mainstream audiences, but especially not to our non-mainstream audiences. So ultimately, we want to be at this end, where the communities are driving the work, and they are helping come up with solutions. So what connects stormwater and environmental justice? We, I'll give you some really short examples to, to think about but it's, as was mentioned by a lot of speakers earlier, it's water quality. So if we have impaired water quality, we have impaired fisheries, especially for subsistence, subsistence fisheries or shellfish, and in some cases even freshwater harvesting. I've seen folks out there uh, trying to pull water weeds that are edible uh, out of ditches. We might have a variety of other environmental issues that come up excuse me, that are related to health. We know that water quality and health, the siting of our facilities, the location, the, the fact that we require all of our residents to pay into our clean water systems, but yet we don't provide them with equal services. All of these are where environmental justice impact 
the way we've set up our systems and how our communities can access them. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Here's an example. So uh, in the Duwamish Valley, Just Health Action had put together a variety of different indicators to look at what are some of our systems and how are they impacting the health outcomes just in this neighborhood. So I'm going to give you just a, I'll pull out a few of the factors. They had many that they looked at. And this one, and pay attention to the dark spots. This one just shows, I unfortunately went decaf recently, and this is not going well. <laughs> anyway, all right, so this one shows the uh, poverty level. Oh, sorry, poverty level in that neighborhood. This one gives you an idea of the foreign born. And this one is rates ecologies sites that were confirmed and suspected contaminated. So by looking at some of these factors, and stormwater wasn't specifically one of them, but I want you to think about this. Looking at these factors, they then asked themselves, what impact did this have overall on the health outcomes of those folks in the darkest areas? And what they found was that there's a 13-year difference in the longevity your life expectancy, if you lived in the Duwamish area, is 13 years less than if you lived in a neighborhood 10 miles away, Laurelhurst. So really, we have real outcomes and impacts on communities by the decisions we make in our work. And this just gives you an idea. So what is changing? We know that, and I'll give you some King County and Puget Sound examples, we know that our area is a magnet for immigration. We have continuing population growth. We have an increase in the diversity of our cultures. And we also have noticed an increasing disparity in our communities and incomes. In the last 10 years, uh, our King County demographer noted that we have a growth in the number of commu uh, communities that are in poverty and a growth in communities that are at the high end of our income and a dip in our middle income. And those areas are showing up in our suburbs, have the highest growth in those income disparities. And also South King County. And we have a continuing shift as well from the unincorporated areas into our cities. So things are changing, the type of people we have moving into our areas and their incomes and their abilities to access our services are changing. Now I'm gonna give you a quick example. Pay attention again to just the darker areas this will show you the purple is 40, over 40% persons of color, and the dark blue is 30 to 40%. So from 1990, 10 years later, 10 years later. So we know that things are changing, and we're getting much more density, different types of folks moving in, especially along our Puget Sound corridor. Another way to look at this as well for King County, we took a look, and what we found since 1990, our non-Hispanic white population has stayed fairly stable. The biggest increases, we have now over 50% of our children are children of color, and most of those are under the age of 18. So that means we have a, a whole different tide of folks that will be rolling through our systems as well. And that's something to consider in our planning. And also, what we found in King County is that we have had a 20, over 20, a quarter more of our population is speaking a language not English. And about half of those folks are reporting that they do not speak English well. So that, again, means that your information may not be hitting its target if you're going for just mainstream audiences. So how can you roll environmental justice into your projects? And remember, it's more than translation. I like to use a social marketing approach because it keeps me on track and it follows an engineering and science framework. It uses research and planning, strategy and implementation, your evaluation, and adjusting your project. And it, it's good because it also 
forces you to look at your situational analysis. What is really going on here? And it's a, it's a comforting approach for those of us that have a science and engineering background because you can feel like you're getting a handle on a problem that you're not familiar with. Oops, sorry. So here's a quick example. Back in 2010, I was given an assignment to try and increase people of color visiting the hazardous waste disposal sites for households. And we went through a process where we decided our audience would be Spanish-speaking audience. So what we ended up doing, because of course, did we have any Latinos on our staff? No, we did not. Um, I also has set a goal of having all of the resources and budget go to the community, not to a third party or um, some other roundabout way. So what we looked at, I started calling everybody I know or would like to know and asked them, and these, I looked specifically for either communications professionals that are bilingual or from that community that do work similar to me or possibly other folks from the target audience. I went to like Washington L&I, uh, Seattle King County Public Health, some of our DCHS folks, some of the nonprofits like the Y, to track down people that are from the community. We brought them in, interviewed them, so that we could get a real feel for what cultural competencies we had to know. And from that, we were able to narrow down our audiences. So what we found was that in the Latino culture, moms value their children's health the most. And I'd say that's probably a common value. And we also found that people uh, really responded to the smell of Clorox. They knew that when they walked into their mother's home or anyone's home and it smelled like Clorox, it smelled like home. So we knew we were going to have a challenge trying to get the Clorox habit out of the you know, use of green cleaners. But it was striking how strong that feeling of nostalgia was. And then we found several other factors that really helped us pull together our overall strategy. Where moms get their information, you know, what time of the day they're doing certain things. And it's fairly predictable and we were super lucky. We we're super lucky in that in the Latino world, it's the media is still set up and you'll find this in many other communities, I suspect. The media is set up so that it does service that community. So a Latina mom might read a paper that she knows will be at the King County Library System. She'll listen to the morning radio program on her way to drop off her kids at school. And in the evening, the whole family will sit down and watch the same television program. And that includes the dads and the grandmothers. So we decided to do a multimedia campaign. And we also decided to use the telenovela, which is a super popular form of uh, very dramatic um, soap operas. So here's our first, here's our first video. Quiero jugo, mamá. Espera un momento, Carlitos, voy por la puerta. Hola. Hola, Rosy. Hola, Rosy. Hola, Hola pasa. ¿Cómo ya? estás? Bien, 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 gracias. Qué bien, qué bien. Ay, Carlitos, esos son los jugos. Laura, los productos químicos nunca deben estar al alcance de los niños. Ay, no pensé. Ellos no piensan como adultos y se pueden confundir con envases como este que es parecido al de los alimentos. ¿Sabías que los productos de limpieza son una de las causas más comunes de envenenamiento de los niños en casa? Por eso debemos de tener especial cuidado con los que dice Danger o Poison. Ay, Rosy, si Carlitos hubieras tomado eso. Ay, qué bueno sí. que estamos acá. Por eso no hay que dejar los productos químicos al alcance de los niños. Acuérdate, más vale prevenir que lamentar. Sí, cierto. Para más información sobre cómo proteger a su familia de productos tóxicos en el hogar, so what this spot shows is one of the key messages, and it really did hit because of our research and and the information that we got from our panels. It really hit home, and I had a near stampede of moms when we first rolled this out, and uh, that we came over to our booth where we pr prominently had our actors pictures and everything, and they they felt very strongly that their community did not get this information and they wanted it. And so with that kind of buy-in, we were able to run a, a campaign that not only helped our Latino outreach, but it strengthened our mainstream audience outreach too, because we were able to identify the key messages that work both for this group in food, these products can look like food, 
uh, don't mix products, they can blow up or make a poisonous gas, how to read the label, and then how to dispose. And then this information was also reinforced by Snohomish County. These are sort of best practices if you're going to do this kind of work, which should be, again, integrated in all our projects. One, build your own you know, cultural capacity. Like, what do you know about the culture? What do you know about their habits and values? And it's not as hard as you think, and it can be very entertaining. Uh, and also, you know, building trust through partnerships and investing in the community by putting your budgets there and working directly with them. And again, testing things and watching the reaction, and just as you would with any other project, tweaking your project to improve the messages. Now, why would we want to do this type of work? We got a lot of problems coming down the road, and they're pretty big. And I don't think we can do it all by ourselves. I think that's kind of what I've been hearing from the earlier speakers as well. When you, when you start integrating this type of information, planning in your projects, it will improve your service delivery as well. You will be getting new insights in your projects that you hadn't had. And by involving communities, you may come up with more interesting answers to the problems. I think we have a lot of opportunity here uh, to get a fresh view and really some new energy and excitement in this field. So one statewide resource I wanted to point out to you on environmental justice is Millie Piazza. And then here again is another video that will give you an idea of what happens when you present information to a community that hasn't previously had your information. So let's see if this will work. Oh, no. Three, two, one. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, I just wanted to say that this is very important information and it's very clear that people need to be aware about the dangers of different cleaning products and myself. Why? Because I use all natural cleaning um, soap in my home. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Dalton. So these projects, whether it's with the deaf or a Latino, these happen without mainstream managers noticing at all. That means these communities are there and live in a parallel universe to ours, and we're not tapping into that energy and empower it all. And getting out there is something that, I, who here likes to travel? Anybody? Uh-huh. Right. You don't have to leave the Puget Sound region to travel. Those people are coming to us, and those cultures are here. And it can be incredibly energizing for you as a project designer to meet an entirely new marketing audience who is excited. And I think we in Stormwater we're part of this larger ecosystem that we should consider. You know, we, as an immigrant as well, I think we can match our values. We have a value in health, in our children's future, in fixing problems, and making things better. And by doing that, really, we, we just can't do all this work by ourselves. And I think that part of our biggest problem is overcoming that we are part of the weird clan. We're part of that Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic group. And so we bring our own biases to it. But when you branch out into new communities, you'll get, really, it will be helpful in how we get a new perspective on how we do projects and maybe some of the solutions. So thank you very much. <laughs>